Hi, I'm Dave Litton from the Projects Academy. Welcome to my short video on tailoring prints to for simple projects. One of the most common questions I get is that students, when they first get hold of the prints to official guide, get totally overwhelmed with the amount of information there. And the last thing they think about is taking prints to and making it more complex. Indeed, prints to is a simple framework that you are supposed to tailor to suit your project. So the question they actually ask most often is how do I use Prince2 for a really, really small project? Well, the answer is I'm not quite sure what you mean by a small project. A small project for a multinational company might be a very large project for a smaller organization. So I'd rather use the word simple since we will all agree what that means. If it's simple, it means it's low risk, probably fairly short in time. It doesn't require a lot of resources and hence you won't need a lot of money to actually run the project. So the rest of this video is assuming that you want to use Prince2 for a simple project. So let's get stuck straight in. Let me start at the beginning, therefore. Directly a project mandate arrives on your desk. The first thing you'll want to do is open the Prince2 official guide or manual and note that the first process that happens before the project starts is called starting up a project. Well, I want you to close the darn manual because I'm going to share with you what exactly is in the manual if it really was a simple project? And when it comes to pre-project, starting up a project, it does not have a plan. Remember, starting up a project is not a stage. It's merely a time frame, and hence it doesn't have a plan for exactly how you're going to spend that period of time. And that's a good thing. Now, this is going to be quick and dirty, and I want you, therefore, to consider startup or starting up a project as simply a checklist of activities you need to do. Now. What you're doing here, pre-project, is trying to sort out some basic things and collect some basic information. What Prince2 does say is that starting up a project should be a fairly quick process. Anything from a few hours to a few days to maybe a few weeks if the project is very large, which is not what we're here to talk about. And what I suggest, therefore, since we're talking about a blazing fast, simple project, that you want to take on the agile approach, if you will, without using agile necessarily, and have an informal, empowered team. That includes you, the project manager, the specialist team, and whoever your project board consists of. So one of the first things you want to do, whatever the size of the project, is to understand who exactly is involved here. Maybe the first question you have is, who exactly is your sponsor? Is it your boss? Who's the executive of the project board? Are they all one and the same? And next up, you think, well, okay, if you're being asked to make a start, then you must be the project manager. And the very next thing that enters your head is, well, who exactly is your customer or user? You'd still need this for the most simple of projects. And who is your supplier? In other words, who's going to provide you with resources? At one extreme for a small, simple project, the project manager could also be the specialist team. But perhaps a mid-ground would be a project manager and an individual with specialist knowledge, depending on the nature of the project. Step three, since this is a simple project, what we don't want to do is overburden it. And among the first management products that Prince2 mentions is the daily log, considering it as the project manager's diary. Now, it could be a file of facts, as I'm showing here, or indeed it could be some electronic form. I'm going to recommend to you immediately that you'd want to use your project diary to store most of the information that you'll be using. So you now know who your sponsor, boss, executive, customer, user and suppliers are, and whether it's you, the project manager, doing everything, or whether you've got at least one specialist team member. You need to make clear who exactly is it who's providing you with the time and money. I suppose providing time merely means you're authorised to work on it, and even the most simplest of projects will expend some money, even if it's just people's timesheet time being tracked internally. And you need the authority not just to proceed, but to start work using those resources. So I put to you, thinking very informally, you need to think through one through five fairly quickly and make sure you understand who they are. When it comes to your specialist team, if it is not you, it could be a third party. It might be a contractor, for example. Remember, I'm assuming this is a simple project. So it's less likely you'd have a third party involved. But it could, for example, be a contractor brought in particularly for this small, simple project, possibly on a week's contract, as an example. 
Now you'll probably already be aware that it's the project mandate that acts as the trigger to any PRINCE2 project. But to remind you, a project mandate can be a verbal instruction. It could be a phone call, or it could be an email. After all, its main purpose is to act as an authority for you to do the startup work. We'll come back to the mandate shortly. At the very least, however, the mandate should outline the project idea, name the executive of the project board who will take responsibility for startup and then for the rest of the project. Stay with that thought for the moment. What type of information, therefore, could you have in a mandate other than just simply a phone call saying, get on with it, make a start? Well, you should have some understanding of what the scope is. This outlines what the project is about and what it will deliver. The scope then sets the boundary. Certainly equally important for a simple project as a complex one, because it'd be very easy for a simple project to get more complex if you didn't nail down exactly what you're supposed to be doing. The objectives, all projects need that, what the project is expected to achieve in terms of outcome, benefits. You see here, we're not talking about the end product, merely what the potential of that end product is, or the outcome, and what benefits it's expected to achieve. I've already talked about responsibilities, as a minimum, the name of the executive and the project manager, and key constraints. All projects have some sort of limits, particularly simple projects. The date, perhaps the end date, the budget, the cost, what resources you can or can't use, whether you've got to follow some form of technology or a process or some other metric that you've got to be constrained by. Particularly for simple projects, it's important to write all this down. After all, this type of information could be gathered sitting at your boss's desk or by a coffee machine. And you'll use this information that you're gathering to drive the creation of the project brief or the PID itself and I'll bet you're surprised at that statement. Keep watching and listening. My best advice when starting up any simple project is to book a room, because you know for sure you want to get the key players, even if it's only you and one other, into a room, even if it's only for an hour or two, so that you can do this work. So you'd want to run an informal startup, creating a project brief, or as I've suggested, maybe a bid workshop. The last thing a simple project needs is to be burdened with lots of documents which in and of themselves consume a lot of time and effort and start to make the project seem more like a complex one. So you may only need to take an hour or two to get this work done. And here's where I'm coming from. You see, the mandate could contain the business need and it could include time and costs for the initiation stage. And if you're thinking that sounds a bit like a business case and the initiation stage plan, you're dead right. So use the talent in the room to capture any lessons. Think of it in terms of what could go wrong and what could go right. Again, write it down. If this is a simple project, you really don't want to be sending out emails and, and researching your organization for any potential lessons. It's highly likely, since this is a simple project, that such a thing really hasn't been done very much before. So my best advice to you is, as I've said here, is to use the talent in the room, and that includes yourself, to gather any lessons that should be applied to this. The mindset for me would be, if this were a standard regular sized project, a more complex one if you will, what lessons have we all learned from those, and are there any of them that could apply to a simple project? So you need to hold an upfront review and form rough estimates for the project's costs, timescales, benefits and risks and pointing your eyes back to the fact that much of that could already be contained within the mandate. So, assuming it isn't, you need to scratch out a down and dirty business case. Now, the business reasons why you need to do it could just be get on and do it, or we've got to do it, for example, something that conforms with new legislation, or it might just be you're sent an email. In other words, the business case could exist only in electronic form. And the two main points of confusion about a business case, check out the Prince2 management product if you will, are the difference between reasons and benefits. Just a polite reminder here, whenever you talk about the reasons for doing a project, they're in the past, whereas the benefits are in the future. So for your simple project, the reason may be that new legislation has been brought out and you therefore must change your process, and the benefits to occur in the future are that your projects will now comply with that new legislation and the benefits may be simple compliance. Again, write them down. 
And the other aspect in a business case that can cause confusion are the business options. And since this is a small and simple project, you could argue quite rightly that the three business options given, that is, do nothing, do the minimum or do something, is that since by definition you're told it's a simple project, it's do the minimum. So there's no real need to go and ask the executive to do it. You, the project manager, can make the three-second obvious decision that we're doing something quick and dirty. Do the minimum, in other words. And the final point I want to make about a general business case is that are there any business constraints? And if this really is an internal simple project, the answer may be there are none. So here's the turning point for you and where most of my students start to get confused about tailoring. The official guide says quite clearly, confirm the project mandate contents and create a project brief. And within the project brief, you'll have the project approach, for example, whether you're going to use internal resources or external resources. And because this is a simple project, the project approach will be fairly obvious. You'll also have in the project brief an outline business case, and this will be refined when you create the PID and something called the project product description, which contains the acceptance criteria for the end product of the project. So apart from the plan for an initiation stage, these are the two main documents you'd be concerned with. And yes, for a simple project, you'd want to develop these live with the team in a workshop environment. But why the question mark? Well, I'll tell you. You see, maybe not. Yes, you'd want to confirm the project mandate contents, but for a small, simple project, project mandate really could contain the business need plus the time cost for the initiation stage. So you really don't need a separate initiation stage plan. And here's the big shocker. <laughs> Who says you need a project brief? Remember this, the official PRINCE2 manual makes it quite clear. You take the mandate, you expand and refine it to become the project brief, and then you expand and refine that in the initiation stage to create the PID. So therefore the PID is some refinement and an expansion of the original mandate. But for a small, simple project, therefore, you really don't need a project brief. You could go straight from mandate to PID. And what do we mean by a simple PID? Well, it just contains four basic areas. The project justification, which may be identical to the business need contained in the mandate, a basic project plan, I'll come to that later, and some product descriptions. It may only be one for a simple project. In other words, the product description is the end product itself, and you still need some form of project controls. Otherwise, you really aren't using PRINCE2, and I'll be covering that in the coming slides. And don't forget, when it comes to project controls, things like reports, managing risks and issues, and quality, you can keep them all informally within your daily log. Because this is a blazing fast, simple project, it's important that you remind yourself to do all of the work here face to face, wherever possible. Keep it informal and verbal. Now the graphic which would have caught your eye immediately is Prince2 Agile. And I'm not suggesting you therefore have to treat simple projects as agile projects, but the agile approach has a lot of good ideas in it with regard to running an informal simple project. Do everything in simple meetings wherever possible, even if you're just simply chatting about it. By all means, post it notes on a wall, information radiators, is what Agile calls them, are a great way to capture quickly ideas and to create plans. I suppose at an extreme, it could be a stand-up meeting, even by a coffee machine. And because I want you to stay away from documents as far as possible, since they take a lot of time and effort, then don't forget some of the technology you've already got to hand. Indeed, this is the graphic here shows, if you've got two or three of you in a room, having a, a notebook or tablets to hand would be a great idea. And if you are creating any information-rich diagrams on whiteboards or walls with post-its, then don't forget your smartphone is good for two things, capturing them in a high-definition picture rather than drawing some complex diagram, and also to clarify information live during the meeting. So what have we learned so far? Well, it's certainly that there are some opportunities for combining or removing altogether some of the more formal documents. And since I've dared to suggest that you take the mandate and refine that directly into the project initiation documentation, then it suggests also that there's some scope here for combining processes. So what I want to do so that we're all starting on the same page is to remind you what a formal, full-blown PRINCE2 project might look like in terms of 
the PRINCE2 processes and the product timeline. So stay with me here because over the coming slides I'm going to strip this bare and show you exactly what a simple project would look like. So starting pre-project with the project mandate, this is issued and it's a trigger as you know. And the first process it would trigger is the starting up a project process. This is all pre-project. Again, just reminding you of some of the things you need, and that is to design and appoint the project management team. In starting up a project, you have two main products, the initiation stage plan and the project brief. And a reminder here that for a normal project, you can have one or more delivery stages. And as I'm about to show you, I'm just going to use three delivery stages for a normal type of project. So starting up a project culminates with the project manager requesting the project board to give authority for the official start of the project. In a normal project, this would often be a formal meeting. And assuming the go-ahead is given, you're now in the first of at least two stages within PRINCE2, and the first stage is always called the initiation stage. What you would use here is the process called initiating a project, whose main purpose is to create the project initiation documentation. The manual recommends that since benefits will typically be realized after project completion, that it's best to keep the benefits review plan as a separate document. So at a helicopter view, they're the main two management products that come out of the initiation stage. But that's not quite all, is it? You see, you would use the managing a stage boundary process, and amongst other things, you would create the stage plan for the next stage, whatever that is. And at the end of the initiation stage, since that is, as the name suggests, a stage, you have an end stage assessment. Again, typically, that would be a formal face-to-face -face meeting with the project board, possibly with the project manager, presenting the information from the initiation stage to get their approval to proceed. One of the key things they'd want, of course, is the stage plan, since if you are going to go ahead, the stage plan contains the timescale, costs and resources needed to carry that work out. A quick reminder here that the initiation stage plan that was created in starting up a project therefore contains information on everything that needs to occur in the initiation stage. And that means not just the creation of the bid and the benefits review plan, but also the work done in managing a stage boundary. Okay, now let's go into the stages. Because I'm suggesting this is a normal project, I'm just going to make the assumption that you've got a further two delivery stages. You could have many more than that, of course. So what happens here? Well, now the project manager would use the process of controlling a stage, where the objective there is that the project manager manages and the specialist products are created by the specialist team. And they have their own process called managing product delivery. Typically a team manager and the specialist team, although it may just be the specialist team themselves. So the first thing the project manager would want to do is to issue the first, or maybe the only, work package within that stage. The team manager or the team needs to accept and agree that work package, and then the work of creating the specialist products begins. Within the work package, it would lay out exactly how often the team has to report progress back to the project manager. This is called a checkpoint. It may be a report. It may be a meeting. Typically, this might be weekly. The project manager also has a responsibility. You see, it's the directing a project process down here, which is where the project board live. And it is they that agreed the start in the first place and were responsible for giving approval at the end stage assessment. So within the work package, it will explain exactly how often the team are to deliver regular checkpoints. It may be a report, it may be a meeting, and typically these would occur weekly. When the work on the work package has been completed, then the team need to inform the project manager that the work package has indeed been completed. But the project manager also has a responsibility to the project board. Because they are managing by exception, one of the PRINCE2 principles, then the project manager needs to give the project board regular progress reports, and this is called the highlight report. In PRINCE2, there are two forms of controls, time-driven or event-driven. Both of these are time-driven because they happen on a regular basis, typically weekly for the checkpoint report, typically monthly for the highlight report, although both of them could be some other time frame. So this is a cycle throughout the stage, the project manager giving out one or more work packages and ultimately being informed that the 
work package is completed. The project manager, of course, needs to assure themselves that that is the case, and then they may issue the next work package and the cycle continues. Within a stage, there may be more than one specialist team, perhaps one performing hardware and software, another mechanical work, and so on, in which case the interface between controlling a stage and managing product delivery could be giving out multiple work packages even at the same time to these different teams. And every work package, as you know, contains at least one product description. Let's imagine now that the work of the stage is complete. Every work package has been given out and all of the products have been created, authorised and signed off. The project manager will now use the process managing a stage boundary to update the PID and carry out product-based planning to create the stage plan for the next stage. In my example here, it's the third and final one. Once more, it's the project board that are responsible for holding an end stage assessment in some way and agreeing or otherwise that the project can indeed proceed to the third stage. In my example, it's also the final stage. So one more time, I won't go through it again, you have the interface between controlling a stage and managing product delivery with regular checkpoints and so on, and the project manager giving regular highlight reports back to the project board. The difference in the last stage, whether it's the third or whatever number, is that the project manager uses the closing a project process, in this case, to close the project. Now the project manager can only request closure because it's the project board that are responsible for authorising that. Good, so what you've just had is what a normal project looks like. But the whole purpose of this video is to talk about a small project. So it's the next slides you'll be most interested in as I peel away the different layers of the onion skin. Let's make a start. Well, for a simple project, I'm suggesting that you typically only want two stages. And so for the rest of these slides, I want to make that assumption. So let's clean the decks a little so you can see exactly what's going on here. What we're saying is we don't need a third stage. So let's move it and show now that the project looks exactly the same. There's no smoke and mirrors here, nothing up my sleeve. I've merely reduced it to showing two stages, the initiation stage plus one delivery stage. Everything else has remained the same. But let me just clean the decks a little just to help me in the coming slides. Watch carefully, I'm not changing anything, I'm just moving stuff around a little. There we go. You've still got the project plan and you've still got the stage plan for the initiation stage. Okay, good. Now, first up. On a simple project, the mandate could be an email. Yes, indeed. And in that email, as I've suggested, it could have other aspects such as the business need included. Now, that won't change our picture in any way, so keep watching. As I suggested, although the mandate could be an email, it could outline the business need. It could also contain the initiation stage costs and timescales, covering all this stuff here, in which case you don't need an initiation stage plan since the work's already done. So goodbye to that. What's next? Well, on a simple project, the project brief may not be needed. As I've suggested, the project mandate is normally refined into the project brief, but if you have sufficient information within a simple project, then we really don't need the project brief either. Why? Because the mandate could be expanded directly, leading to the creation of a simple bid. Let's see what that looks like. Goodbye project brief. And if it's a simple bid, then we wouldn't really want any other documents. So the benefits review plan as a separate document is no longer needed. So goodbye to that as well. So let's just clean the decks and see where we've got to. Okay, it's looking somewhat simpler already, but stay with me, there's more fun to come. So the pre-project time frame and the initiation stage could be combined. Why? Well, we're taking the mandate and we're jumping straight to the PID, in which case the pre-project and the initiation stage is really one time frame. So let's repaint that picture right now. There we go. I haven't changed anything else. I've merely combined this into one. And this shows exactly what we're doing. We're taking the mandate, we still need the project team, and we refine the project mandate into the PID itself. Everything else thus far looks the same. Let's continue. I want to remind you of something I said in an earlier slide. The daily log could be used to record risks, issues, lessons, and the quality of results. What does that mean? It means aspects such as configuration item records could be used in the daily log. 
the issue register is not needed because the daily log is acting as that, along with the lessons log, and along with the risk register and the quality register. The quality register, if you remember, is there to record the outcome of the quality checks on the product descriptions. And of course, the daily log, for example, if it's a file of facts or similar, could be used to develop the project plan. Now, what I'm inferring here is not that you draw a project plan inside your file of facts, because one of the things about the project plan is you would need to get the project board to approve it. And loaning them your file of facts isn't very practical. But certainly to develop the ideas within the project plan, you could do that in the daily log quite easily. In a normal, more complex project, you may well use a planning tool such as Microsoft Project. You may want to produce a simple version here. On the other hand, if it's a simple project with only one delivery stage, it's almost something you could sketch out, possibly on a whiteboard, and take a picture of it with someone's smartphone. So what does that bring us to? Let me now expand the project initiation documentation. Since we've agreed for a simple project, this is going to be simple as well. So a simple PID, which will include the project plan, one or more product descriptions, that's it, and details of how you're going to control the project. From my earlier slides, you'll know it's going to be simple, informal, and face-to-face -face as much as possible. Although the project manager may simply email a highlight report to whoever the project board is. And the project board at its simplest may simply be one individual, representing business, user, and supplier. So the simple PID includes project justification, which in effect is the business case, a basic project plan, and also one or more product descriptions. You may after all only have one product in this simple project and details of how you're gonna control the project. And those details could indeed be held in your file of facts. So what else can we strip away? Well, I'm suggesting the project manager would hold regular verbal checkpoints. So there's absolutely no need for a checkpoint report. Be careful here. That doesn't mean that checkpoints won't happen. It's merely that they'll be discussed, possibly by the project manager, walking up to the specialist team, whoever that is, how are you doing, what have you done, and what's remaining. So it's goodbye checkpoint reports. What else? Well, there's no need for stage plans. After all, since there's only one delivery stage, the project plan covers all the remaining work after the project initiation documentation has been approved. Put simply, the project plan will cover the second stage, since the project plan covers this point in time right the way through to the end of the project. So if it's goodbye to stage plans, there's also no need for team plans and work packages, since you're working at project level with project tolerances and creating the product or products in that project. So goodbye work packages. Notice you'd still want the project manager using the controlling a stage process and the specialist team using the managing product delivery process, but it's being done a lot more informally. So if we're using verbal checkpoints in this simple project, why on earth would you want to do anything other than have a verbal end stage report? After all, you're about to transit from the initiation stage to the one and only delivery stage. Possibly a brief meeting with everyone present is all you'd need to do. So a formal end stage assessment will not be needed, merely a verbal agreement. So it's goodbye end stage assessment. Let's take stock on this. Since we have one delivery stage and then the project is closed at the end of it, only an end project report is needed. So goodbye to that. And the end project report in and of itself should include aspects such as follow on action recommendations. Do you remember those are any remaining issues that need to be worked and identifying anyone that needs to do any follow up, such as measuring benefit realizations. That's merely a reminder of anything that needs to be worked on once the project has completed. The benefits management approach should be here as well. And that is how are you going to realize benefits with the product of the project? Who should do it? and how should it be measured, and so on. Because it's a simple project, it's almost certain that the benefits management approach will also be very simple and could be merely stated in a couple of sentences. And all important, lessons report. Because this is a simple project, it could act as a benchmark for this to happen more frequently within your organization. 
So lessons and guidelines of what we did well and what we needed to change would be very valuable indeed. So let me now quickly summarize what we've got. We've got a startup process and the initiation stage combined as one time frame, if you will. The official start, therefore, is with the trigger of the project mandate, which could be something as simple as an email. And for a small, simple project, there's no reason at all why this shouldn't include the business need plus an expectation of initiation stage costs and timescales. Let me just pause for a moment and take time out here. If this is a small and simple project, do you agree that you could get a team together in a room and create a simple PID, including a simple project plan? How long would that take? One hour, two hours, three hours, five hours maybe? Would you agree almost certainly for a simple project, the startup and initiation stage could start and indeed finish within a 24 hour period? So when I say it needs to include the initiation stage costs and timescales, that's one day in duration and maybe two or three people in a room. So you really don't need a complicated initiation stage plan to work that out. You'd use the daily log for risks, issues, lessons and quality, as I've mentioned already, and to make notes on the creation of your project plan that you would create in this same meeting, because you're going to take the mandate and expand it into a simple PID consisting of project justification, simple project plan, product descriptions, one or more, and how you're going to carry out project controls. Most of that could be captured in the daily log and the project manager merely email the information to others. As I've suggested, the simple project plan might be worth doing separately. So what I'm suggesting here is that you have a face-to-face -face end stage assessment meeting in order to approve the bid plus the delivery stage. And because there's only one stage, it's the delivery stage, then the project plan doubles as the stage plan. Therefore, you don't need a stage plan. The level of detail in the project plan along with its controls, will be adequate as it is from the beginning to the end of the one and only delivery stage. So this needs to be approved, again, possibly verbally, at the end of a workshop meeting, and we're then into the delivery and final stage combination. What have we got here? We've got a project plan, which we'll be using to manage the level of detail for the rest of the project. We'll be using verbal checkpoints and highlight reports although you may want to email salient points to key stakeholders, including the project board. You're creating products using the product descriptions alone. It is their quality criteria and the method and the resources needed that will guide the rest of this delivery stage. And you'll be carrying out informal methods for the management of issues, risks and quality. In other words, capturing it in your daily log, whether that be a file of facts or some electronic system. And finally, once the end product has been approved, the project manager will want to create an end project report. And it is that that will trigger project closure. Good. By way of closing, let me remind you of my first slide where I said I wanted to call this a simple project, not a small one, since small is slightly ambiguous. What I hope you've got out of this is some ideas about stripping away the complexity and tailoring prints too, so that you still harness the power of the method but use it in an appropriate manner. I hope I've given you some ideas and some encouragement about using Prince2 for some of your smaller projects. And may I suggest that the next steps for you is to get your hands on my Prince2 Premium Primer today. My name is Dave Litton from the Projects Academy. You can find my Prince2 Primer on www.prince2primer.com. Thanks for your attention, thanks for your interest, and I look forward to working with you in the near future. Bye for now.